introduce myself. I'm Chris Martin with the Davis Center, and I am going to be talking about um, creating the new Soviet man, education in the USSR. As you can imagine, it's a humongous topic. It's 70 years of history. The system they put in place was not monolithic. It changed over time. It responded to trends that were happening in the political sphere and the economic sphere. Um, it was multifaceted insofar as they were educating people as young as you know, newborns, I through preschools and early education, up to pensioners, particularly early in the 20s when they were introducing literacy campaigns. So I've tried to focus, narrow it down a little bit. Um, I'm not going to be talking at all about university education, about sort of post high school, what we would consider high school um, education, although I could certainly probably answer some questions about it if you had some. Um, so I hope, though, it gives you a good idea of what the structure was, um, what their policy were, policies were, as well as what it was like to be a student in the USSR at various times. So we've already mentioned that when the Soviets came to power in 1917, they inherited a very backward nation full of inequalities. Um, they did not seek to simply bring those who were on unequal footing up to speed. They actually sought to totally revolutionize and create a new society. Um, their primary goal was to develop a new society replete with like-minded individuals who were devoted to developing and maintaining a socialist nation. These individuals um, came to be known as the new Soviet man and woman, sometimes referred to as homo sovieticus, um, sort of a tongue-in-cheek approach to that. But they really had um, a really good idea of what kind of person they expected to be a citizen of the USSR. Um, Lenin and his peers needed to destroy old societal norms, chief among them a pervasive belief in God, um, which also was a, a leading um, uh, piece of the Tsarist educational program was, it was a very religious uh, based education. Um, they needed to replace this system with a holistically communist society ruled by national consensus, devoid of any individualism that might cause dissension. So this society could only come to pass if the very nature of man himself was changed. So this lecture will discuss how the Soviet government used education to create the new Soviet man and the ideal Soviet society, and if they were successful or not. Um, the task, as I've mentioned, was monumental. It was not monolithic. It reacted to other um, trends. Um, so let's take a look. So who was the new Soviet man? What was the definition of the new Soviet man? Here's a definition just from the Library of Congress. Theoretical goal of several Soviet regimes to transform the culturally, ethnically, and linguistically diverse peoples of the Soviet Union into a single Soviet people behaving according to the ideology of Marxism and Leninism. Um, now this, this idea of creating a new person was pretty implicit in Karl Marx's understanding of the transition from a capitalist democracy to a communist society. But as some of our uh, earlier presenters have already suggested, the transition that Marx envisioned, which was from a capitalist society to a socialist society to a communist society, was supposed to be something that happened very naturally. Um, the transition was supposed to be brought about by changing beliefs amongst the people, and that's not how it happened in the USSR. Lenin and his fellow socialists saw an opportunity to seize power and they took it. So Marx's idea that the people themselves would change, the people themselves would develop these proletarian attitudes, and they would therefore act on these attitudes to bring about a socialist government didn't happen. So what happens is now Lenin and this select cohort of socialists have taken power, but they're ruling a nation where Many people don't believe in what they believe. Many more have no idea what they believe in because they don't have access to media or to other kinds because they live in very rural parts of the country. Um, they don't speak the same language. So they are forced to figure out ways to bring this very diverse, multi-ethnic, illiterate society and form it into this new type of person and make them all sort of similar. Um, so Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin, too, they insisted that the political regime had to play an active role in the transformation of this society. And they did so um, th through a variety of different initiatives starting in the 1920s. Um, so the, the, the Soviet man should, uh, and, and a good child, we'll talk about what a good child should be, um, because this, this presentation is really about sort of um, early education. A good child is obedient, um, diligent properly dressed. There's a lot of focus on hygiene amongst um, sort of the Soviet ideology and uh, uh, the implementation of that, and has human and animal friends. You see a lot about that exploring nature, 
um, going out and, and becoming one with nature, particularly during the 1920s. That's a big facet of their educational priorities. The only difference is found in the degree um, the Soviet child is expected to show obedience to authorities, be it father, teacher, or governmental authority. So the difference being between US children, potentially, and, and, and Soviet children. Um, and so again, the basic aim of Soviet education is to produce a new type of person. So how are they going to go about doing this? What were their sort of their early educational goals? Uh, there were three primary goals in the early 1920s. So this is post-Civil War. And remember, the Civil War was extraordinarily damaging, um, both economically and physically to the country, uh, emotionally. Um, and they were also bankrupt. So now they're implementing this, all of these new changes in policies when they have very little, uh, they do not have a strong foundation upon which to build. So the first thing they wanted to do was enact compulsory education for all children for at least four years. So that shows you the vast majority of children living in what was Tsarist Russia were not getting at least four years of education. Um, some of them would start and drop out, others would not attend at all, and that had, had issues regarding access. There simply were no schools in some areas. There were problems with parents not wanting to send their children to school because either they didn't agree with the, the, sort of the, um, the point of view of the government or they couldn't spare them from whatever work they were doing on their own independent farms. So there were a variety of reasons why kids weren't in school. There were a, a supreme lack of teachers, which is a problem you see throughout the Soviet period. Um, so again, they wanted four years of compulsory education, although this was expanded to a goal of 10 years of compulsory education by the 19, early 1930s. Second, they had to erase the vestiges of the Tsarist educational system, much of which I've already said was organized and based upon religious uh, dogma and administered, in fact, by the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, by the time the Soviets came to power, they did develop um, basically what be, was more or less the Soviet Ministry of Education. Um, they called it Narkompros, the um, Institute for Enlightenment. And um, they were able to sort of command all of the education policies and practices from Moscow. It was, it was a sort of a central command kind of situation, as much of um, the economy was as well. So they were able to dictate all um, learning and educational imperatives, uh, including re removing religion from school. Yeah, Shannon. Um, were boys and girls ever separate? Like in the they were briefly, but okay. the priority really was to have co-education. There was a time during the Second World War where they did segregate um, schools, but that, that came back together quickly. And for the vast majority of time, uh, kids were educated together. Um, and third and finally, they needed to teach their citizens, including adults, how to read. As uh, I think Robin already mentioned, um, the vast majority of Russians were illiterate in 1917. Um, so that was their number one priority. And not only amongst children, although children were absolutely their priority, but also amongst adults. So according to Lenin, literacy was a precondition for the participation in political life. Um, but as I said, the Soviet Union was not a literate nation. In 1917, only 24% of the population was literate. That was 38% of the male population and only 12.5% of the female population. And you can imagine of that population, if you broke it down, it's more likely to be the wealthy who can read or um, people who were, re who were religious, either in the church itself or as religious educators. Um, and only through achieving literacy could the Bolsheviks effectively indoctrinate the new citizenry and socialist ideals and begin to replace the influence of the church with the influence of reason, science, and ideology. So in 1919, um, the Soviet government passes the decree on the elimination of literacy, illiteracy amongst the population. There is one small problem. Um, not everybody in the USSR speaks the same language. Um, many of the minority languages, particularly the Central Asian languages, have no written alphabet. So not only do they need to figure out a way to teach these people to read, they need to develop alphabets for these languages. Um, even the existing Cyrillic alphabet was um, simplified at this time. Uh, alphabets and textbooks were created. Uh, locals were educated in Moscow and sent back to their home republic or to their, um, their, home t their hometown to help uh, educate their peers. Um, and they did surprisingly have an early policy called kornizatsiya, which means ind indigenization. So although you might assume that the initial policy would be that everyone should speak Russian, everyone should read Russian, that was not actually the initial policy. That would come into effect much, uh, quite a few years later in the USSR where there really was an attempt at Russification and everyone being sort of Russified, speaking Russian. Um, and Russian being the really dominant um, ethnicity. There was a pol this policy of um, Kornizatsiya said that we want you to be able to read and we don't really care what language it is. We just want you to be able to read and communicate and write in your language. Um, 
so these are a couple of, I think, really beautiful um, literacy campaigns, particularly this one here. Mama, if you knew how to read, you could teach me how to read. So a definite example of, of the communal spirit, let's teach each other how to read, which became a, a big thing in the future. So the Soviets implement the Likbyaz campaign, which stipulated that people between the ages of 8 and 50 were to become fluent readers and writers in their own native language. The campaign was multifaceted. It had a number of um, ways it was implemented. One, special literacy schools were opened. Um, workers were allowed to take two hours off work each day if they were to spend those hours in learning how to read. Um, reading rooms or literary huts, I think we actually saw an image of them in the um, three songs. We saw women sitting in a circle with some paper. I think that was probably an example of a literary hut. Um, were created throughout the country. As you can imagine, these actually served more as propaganda centers than as a, as a library because people were only given um, very propagandistic material to read. Um, they would have a peasant who would act locally as a red reader and who would lead discussion amongst their peers on, on the text that were sent by the party. Um, attendance was often mandatory. You might be required by your factory, by your farm, by um, even your local party to attend these kind of um, literary circles. And there was also, it was the only way a lot of people who were very rural were hearing about what was happening in the outside world. They couldn't read anything that was coming out um, in a newspaper. They may or may not have a stop by an agitational train or an agitational boat. So this was a way that they were keeping informed as well of what was happening in their new nation. There was a sub-campaign called Every Reader Teach Another. So there was an expectation that you were to share your new skills if you were a strong reader with other people. There were expectations that children who were learning to read, who probably picked it up faster than their parents, would help teach their parents how to read. So you can imagine the paradox and the complexity of that relationship when you're trying to teach your, your parent to, to do, have a skill that you don't know, which although maybe some of us do when we try and teach your mother how to use the internet or something. Um, <laughs> And this was actually a very successful campaign. It was a campaign that was successful insofar as other countries were interested in adopting it. Not necessarily successful in that it actually taught readers to read in the Soviet Union. Um, so the campaign itself was reportedly a very great success early on, but a lot of that was propagandistic. They wanted to show early results of the Soviet system. Um, in reality, people didn't have the time or the energy or even the interest, particularly in the older generation, in, uh, in spending their time reading and, and learning from their 10-year-old how to read. Um, and by the end of the 1920s, very little headway had been made on the, in the fight against illiteracy, only about a 6% increase in the total number who could read, so about 44% by, um, by 1926. And this includes children. Um, this trend did begin to reverse as more and more peasants relocated to urban centers. So as industrialization increased, people were leaving farms and going to cities. There was one, a bigger reason to learn to read because you're now in a more urban environment. And two, there were more resources in urban environments, more centralized in cities than there had been in um, rural environments. That said, over the long haul, the Soviets were extraordinarily successful in eradicating illiteracy by 1936, so this is about 17 years after the implementation of the program. Nearly 75% of the population was literate. That's 86% of the men and 65% of the women, so there's still a gender divide. So. In 1917, it was 24, 26 percent. Let's see. Yeah, in 1917, it was 24 percent of the population. And in uh, 1926, it was 44 percent. By 1936, it's 75 percent. So, I mentioned before that there were opportunities for adults to become educated. In addition to the literacy campaign, they did institute a series of um, educational schools called Rob Fox, it's an abbreviation, um, that allowed workers, new workers, to go and get sort of a vocational education. Um, most of them did not have any kind of real substantive education, but it, was, it really was targeted at training them for the workforce. Um, but, but more than anything, the Soviets really focused on educating children. They really saw um, children as the future, as Whitney would say, and they really focused on them. And it's clear that there's a lot of psychological research that says you can, you know, you can still new ideas in children much easier than you can than changing ideas and beliefs in adults. 
So they really focused on kids and creating this new Soviet person. In Lenin's own words, if you give us a child for eight years, it will be a Bolshe Bolshevik forever. And although this sounds fairly ominous, uh, in general, the Russian and later Soviet attitude towards children was very, very generous. Children were long considered to be the only privileged class in a classless society. And one of the long enduring slogans in the USSR was all the best for our children. And in general, children were really doted upon, particularly inside the home, although there was a lot of strict uh, supervision, particularly in the school setting. They were very much doted upon. They were very much um, spoiled in their home life. So that said, Soviet education from its earliest inception had many of the same goals as most national educational systems. They needed to provide academic and vocational training, as well as social character training. It just so happened that the character they were trying to build was this new socialist character, and there was no room for interpretation by the individual, and there was certainly no alternative. So I mentioned already that the trends within education followed the larger trends that were happening in the Soviet Union. So if you think about the 1920s, we've talked already about it being a period of really great experimentation, um, creativity, fluidity. People had more opportunity to think about how to actually create this new system, and you see that reflected in the education system as well. The Stalin era brings in much more tightness, much more control over the system. The Khrushchev thaw did apply in a way to the classroom. Brezhnev era of stagnation was certainly happening in the classroom. There were some new ideas, but it was more sort of a status quo. People began to awake to um, the ridiculousness of what they were being taught in school and how they were being expected to behave in the public sphere versus the private sphere. And under Gorbachev, there's a re-examination of priorities. Are we where we should, are supposed to be? What should this education system look like? Um, so those things that you see sort of you can categorize as larger Soviet history can be seen um, in uh, this period as well. So like I said, the, um, so the three mainstays I should mention of Soviet education, particularly in the beginning, in the 1920s, were an emphasis on polytechnic education, which is somewhat like vocational education, but a little bit different, I'll explain. Vospitanye, which can be tra translated roughly as moral education and political socialization sort of rolled into one. And a healthy dose of discipline. What was the word? Vospitania. You'll see it on a slide in a minute. Um, so in the 1920s, many schools implemented a type of curriculum known as the complex method. Again, this is a period of great experimentation. They're learning from um, people uh, like Dewey, Montessori, Belinsky. They're thinking about education through play. Um, it's really a time of experimentation to see what is going to work for our society. And one way they, they decide to go is towards the complex method. This method was advocated by uh, Nadezhda Kupskaya, who was Lenin's wife and who was an educational theorist and um, practitioner and policymaker. Um, the complex method itself, what it meant is that teachers did not focus on developing individual curricula to teach specific subjects. Rather, they focused on a series of themes across subjects that related to nature, labor and society. So you can see the idea of labor, the idea of a, co a communal society, they wanted this to sort of go across everything the kid learned, everything a child learned in, in the classroom. So the underlying goal was not to remove education from real life, but rather to have real life, and in a communist society, real life meant agriculture and industry, inform every aspect of schooling. But there were not nearly enough well-trained imaginative, imaginative teachers in the 1920s to make the complex method a success in Soviet schools. This pedagogy was highly unpopular with teachers and with parents who felt like their children were going to school but weren't learning anything. It was also abundantly clear that the complex method was not producing the highly skilled, technically oriented workforce needed to develop Soviet industry. So, with the Stalin years, you can remember that we talked about the first five-year plan that was implemented in 1928. With this plan, the USSR enters a new period. Industrialization, massive construction projects, and electrification projects required many high-skilled laborers, technicians, and engineers. In the early 1930s, schools were more integrated into Soviet central planning. Individual responsibility was reinstated because this complex method also included having no grades, having um, basically no homework, um, having very little discipline, 
provided to children. Children having a lot of responsibility for sort of self-discipline and disciplining their peers, which this element actually continues throughout the Soviet period. But there was little um, way to judge if this curriculum was working on the individual or classroom basis. So Stalin comes to power. He needs to have more technically skilled people graduating from school. And so they do a 180 and they go back to something that looks like more traditional European classroom management. Um, kids have grades now, kids have homework, um, and they had to wear school uniforms become mandatory during this period. In short, there's a big effort to upgrade teaching of math, science, and technical skills in particular. So actually under Khrushchev, education opens up a little bit. The thaw did reach the classroom, particularly regarding the elimination of the cult of the leader that had infected every classroom during Stalin's reign. Khrushchev's main concern with educational priorities concerned the fact that he felt that Soviet schools were too snobbish and too bookish and were producing too many white collar laborers. Initial polytechnic education was really about developing the worker, about developing people who were going to work on the kolkhoz, but over time through the Stalin period when there was an emphasis on creating engineers, creating very highly skilled laborers, not manual laborers, but people who really knew how to develop projects, developed um, dams, civil engineers, um, that they had gotten away from sort of the blue, more blue collar mentality um, that, they, that the Soviet Union had more or less been built upon. So there was a growing sense that a segment of society looked down on manual labor. So there was a big push under Khrushchev to forge a stronger connection between school and industry. This included the addition, after you finished your 10 years, 10 years of schooling, of an additional year of practical training for each student. And that practical training would mean that it would qualify you to go out and get sort of a more blue collar job after you left school. But it also meant that teachers had to be re-educated in how to teach these technical skills, either through job training or short courses, and that industrial and agricultural workers themselves were expected to pitch in either by offering workshops to local students, having local students come out to their farm or come out to their industry to learn on the job. Um, and even though it sounds, it kind of sounds great, you know, a kid learns a skill, people are sharing ideas, in practice it was a disaster. Because industries themselves did not always run very well, particularly in the 1960s, the 1970s, as we're getting farther away from the beginning of the Soviet period. Um, Teachers didn't know what to teach students. They did not come away with a very well-rounded background. It was often very specific to whatever industry you were assigned to. So it did not really accomplish the goal of, of creating more um, skilled workers. The practice of an additional year of schooling and practical training was dropped in 1964, which is the year that Brezhnev came to power. So this change marks one of the few hallmarks of Brezhnev's educational policy in general. As you've already heard, the Brezhnev years um, were a period of stagnation across the board in economics, culture, politics, and education. Um, there was a larger and larger disconnect between students' private lives at home and their public lives in school. There was a lot of hypocrisy on the part of teachers who were having to maintain the party line, whether or not they believed it. Um, it is a Soviet anecdote where a, a, an adult was looking back on his education and said, my friend got up and said, well, you've all heard how the soldier would go, would go into battle shouting, for the motherland, for Stalin. But just imagine if a war started now. Would people really shout, for the motherland, for Brezhnev? And the class cracked up laughing, as you can imagine. So this idea, this, this founding ideology is waning uh, even in the Soviet classroom. But it's still being taught as this is the way you are to believe. This is what you are supposed to believe and how you're supposed to act. So this disconnect developed over time and children learned quite early in life about the schizophrenic split between talking freely at home but carefully conforming to and concealing their views in public. One other addition during the Brezhnev years was compulsory military training for all older students, both male and female. Um, they needed to complete 140 hours of training plus an additional 30 hours over the summer. The goal was to teach attitudes and knowledge necessary to defend the motherland. I think this is certainly the time of the Cold War, too. One second. And um, the courses themselves were taught by military instructors, although many times these military instructors had no more than a high school diploma. You can imagine it would be difficult to argue that your highest military commander should be teaching 17-year-olds how to tie a tourniquet or put on a gas mask. Um, 
Children also receive civil defense, civil defense training beginning in the third grade, 35 hours a year, learning how to protect themselves from nuclear and chemical weapons during the, the, uh, during the Cold War. Yeah, Jennifer. That military aspect, is that just during Brezhnev, or is that consistent with Khrushchev? It's mostly focused on during the Brezhnev period, but I think that there were other elements, particularly the civil defense was focused on during different periods too, but it was a big push under, under Brezhnev. Yeah, Philip. At what point were kids tracked based on skills and abilities? that were recognized early, like in sport? And, uh, there were special schools, particularly for people who did sports and music and things like that. Um, there were a couple of special, like, math schools in particular, too, that people could be tracked to. Um, it was mostly happened in the big cities. It was not something that was very widespread, because there were not always very many spots at these kinds of schools. Um, but I think it, you would be you would start fairly young, so it would be at a very young age. In general, um, there was not a lot of special opportunities to excel in these programs. There was not, that was not, the foundational argument of Soviet schools was the communal. It was not about the individual. So there was not really, there were certain ways to excel. You did get, you did get medals, you could wear your medal, but in general there was an expectation that everybody excelled. Everybody excelled to the same level and not, you know, everyone exceeded the production quota. Everyone excelled to the same level. Um, so there wasn't a lot of differentiation for, based on actual performance or um, uh, ability in a lot of ways. Um, so last, the last period I'll talk about before I go back into the educational spectrum relates to Gorbachev and the policies of glasnost and perestroika. Um, Soviet education did indeed go under modification during this time even though the period itself was short-lived. First and most apparent was the abolition of the school uniform um, under Gorbachev and the, relax and the relaxation of rules surrounding classroom behavior. But most importantly, teachers were relieved of the, requ of the requirement that they interject Marxist-Leninist ideology throughout the curriculum. They were allowed to use and adapt new sources and materials besides the state-issued te uh, textbook. And their performances, the teachers' performances, um, as well as the student performances, were much less likely to be scrutinized by school or Soviet authorities. Unfortunately, most teachers did not know what to do with this newfound freedom. They had absolutely no training in how to, to adapt other materials. They were so used to following the party line, they didn't know what else to do, they didn't know what materials to turn to, and so more often than not, they did nothing, they made no changes. They were also afraid that they would, they would still fall afoul of the party line, even if it was clear that they were not being monitored as closely. So polytechnic education, what exactly does that mean? Um, it was part and parcel of the Soviet system from its inception, although its influence did wax and wane over time. It can be defined as the physical, psychological, intellectual, aesthetic, and social development of children. So what does that really mean? The biggest point of it was to really link the classroom to the real world. And for children in all of the school subjects they studied, to understand the processes underlying industrial and agricultural production. Lenin believed that the school outside life and politics was a lie and hypocrisy and that the fundamental difference between socialist education and education in a bourgeois society was that the latter was estranged and cut off from labor and life. So children were meant to learn by doing, caring for plants and animals, working with different materials, operating tools and machines, taking nature walks, and drawing from representational models. So how was this different from vocational education? And that my last example about them going out to nature and doing hands-on was very much in the, in the 1920s. Um, more than any other period. So how is polytechnic education different from VOTEC, vocational education? Vocational ed focuses specifically on preparing an individual for a specific job. So you become you know, a lathe operator. You become somebody who's a refrigerator repairman. It's really giving you the skills to do one job. Whereas polytechnic education meant that every skill you studied in math, you would be doing problems that would prepare you for something, but it would also do mean word problems that said, on the Kolkos, there were 14 cows, and if you added 12 more cows, so everything that you studied had to do with the life and labor um, of the Soviet Union. There was an expectation that not only would school connect to industry, but that industry would connect to school, as I've already mentioned. Um, since many new schools had to be built, especially in the 1920s, many were built on or near collective farms or near major industrial centers and factories. Um, in fact, this poster basically advocates that um, a school be built um, here and that they locate a metal shop and a wood shop on either side of the classroom so that kids would have the opportunity daily to interact with industry. 
And again, I think it sounds like a very usable model, but in a nation that's trying to industrialize, would you really put your resources in having the best possible equipment at a secondary school for kids to be using? Would you put your best workers in charge of getting these kids up to task on these skills, or would you have them out producing in an actual factory? Um, so the rubber didn't always meet the road with this. Um, consequently, because the system itself didn't turn out the way that it was looking on paper, Stalin abolished his polytechnic education in 1937. Um, this was seen as sort of the underlying cause for that rise in school snobbery and the elevation of sort of the academic over the vocational or the polytechnic, which vexed Khrushchev so. Um, regardless of the presence or absence of polytechnic education, there still was always a constant focus on math, science, and technology in the Soviet classroom. So in addition to incorporating work-life principles into the classroom, students were also expected to engage in socially useful labor. This meant they could gather scrap metal, they could pick up trash, there were a lot of campaigns to pick up recyclable paper. Um, some of this happened in the schools, but a lot of it happened in, through e mandatory extracurricular activities, which I'll talk about in a minute, including the Young Pioneer Movement. So what is Vospitanie? Vospitanie was um, the idea of transferring the experience of the older generation to the younger one, particularly regarding character training, um, sort of morality and ethics, um, you'll see socio-political awareness, patriotism and internationalism, military patriotic education, labor education, mental development and the raising of general culture, atheism, knowledge of the law and obligations of citizens, economic, aesthetic, and physical education. It was basically what was going to turn you into the ideal Soviet man or woman. Now, this is not to say that there was extraordinarily always overt political indoctrinization. It was, it was sometimes very subtle, particularly depending on the, the, um, the grade level. And there are some who believe that political education in schools must be defined broadly, says Susan Jacoby. It does include specific indoctrination on specific issues. However, most thoughtful Soviet educators insist that social consciousness is much more important than the specifics of political instruction. The general values of Soviet society, identification with the group, muted individualism, respect for authority, occupy a more important place in the work of the school than anything else. If children internalize these values, the teacher need not worry about their loyalty on any given issue. So I mentioned before that the school spectrum started at preschool. Um, started with very, very young children and one of the early goals of Soviet education was to provide preschool to Soviet children. And there were multiple reasons for this. The first and foremost is they wanted to end what they deemed the domestic slavery of women. They wanted to give women the opportunity to go out into the workforce, and they would not be able to do so unless they had state-sponsored care for their children. Number two, they understood, of course, that it's easiest to influence the mind and behaviors of the very young children. If they could get them in the pipeline early, they'd have to do less work at indoctrinating them and uh, making them into these ideal Soviet citizens. And finally, there was a real impetus on behalf of the state to take child rearing out of the hands of individual families and entrust children to the state. There were even some who argued that children at the very early ages should be taken away from their parents and put into more of an institutional type care and that the collective really should be um, caring for them. They didn't necessarily win the day. Um, parents still obviously remained very hands-on and cared for their children and actually a good majority of children never actually went to Soviet preschools and, and were instead raised at home until age seven when they entered um, the general school by their parents. Um, one of the reasons why they wanted to get the parents out of control was that a lot of um, children were being cared for by older women, by uh, babushkas, by grandmothers who not only were potentially old-fashioned but were also probably very religious and were instilling in these young impressionable minds either a respect for a religion or a belief in God that the Soviets would then have to undermine with their own level of schooling once they turned seven. So like I said though, the Soviet government was not capable of enrolling all Soviet students in preschool. They, didn't, they literally didn't have the teachers in the space, even if there had been enough interest on behalf of families. Um, enrollment might be as high as 80% in the cities, but it usually hovered around 20% in rural areas. Um, a preschool uh, a, a teacher who, who was a kindergarten teacher once observed that children entering um, the kindergarten first grade classroom, she could tell obviously right away who had attended a Soviet preschool and who had been raised in their early years by their grandmother um, because the kids who had been to preschool had a better understanding of the Soviet way of life by the age of six and seven. 
Political socialization was actually fairly minimal and fairly subtle in Soviet preschools. It focused mostly on inculcating a sense of love and awe for Lenin. Children were watched over by Lenin in the classroom. You can see in this picture here, he's standing above them. It says the 8th of March next to him. Uh, he's, you see his picture in many, many classrooms. He's always sort of there looking on. Um, they would read songs and sing songs about, read stories and sing songs about Jia Jia Lenin, about Uncle Lenin and his love and concern for children. They would take field trips to specific locations, potentially out to the bench in front of the, the place where he died, to talk about his life and his work and to ground it in an actual play setting where they could connect to it. Um, that said, most of the social conditioning in preschools was about character education, developing desirable social behavior and classroom norms rather than specific political beliefs. By the age of four, it's, it was said that Soviet children develop an understanding of which, which questions can be asked and which ones must be avoided. And the gravest mistake in the preschool and kindergarten classroom is individuality. Projects took on a complete aura of conformity. It was not be unusual to go and visit your child's classroom and to see 15 pictures of daisies where the stems were at the exact, they were the same height, they were at the same angle, they'd be the same number of petals, they'd be in the same orientation, they were all the same color. And anybody who has a four-year-old realizes that doesn't happen naturally. Um, and a teacher who was a preschool educator said it would only confuse a child to see the person next to him doing something different. So as you can see, the groundwork conform for conformity the idea of the collective spirit, the communal spirit, uh, a love of nation and leader was laid early. Um, as I mentioned, children uh, attended preschool till age seven when they entered what they called the general school. So the general school um, was from ages seven to 17. Like they said, during the, the Khrushchev years, there was an additional year for practical training, but in general, it was a 10-year school. The school year started every year on September 1st, and it ended every year on June 1st. Regardless of where you live in the USSR, you started school on September 1st, and you ended on June 1st. You knew when everyone's vacation was. There was no differentiation. The first day of school was a very festive event uh, in each community. It was known as the Day of Knowledge, and students would come dressed in their school best, carrying flowers for their teachers and flanked by their parents. There would be a brief opening ceremony where the school director would give a speech about dedication to the party and to the state and why the students should all work hard in the coming, in the coming year. There were also uh, morning assemblies thereafter called Len uh, Leneka, where there was more speechifying by teachers, administrators, and student pioneers. So you can see every day was started with this ide ideology. And maybe it wasn't as brutal. Um, it wasn't as forceful, but it was part of their everyday experience. It's what they heard every day. But there's also the question of how much of it did they hear? If you hear something every day, if you do something every day, it becomes so routine that it begins to lose its value. If you see propaganda posters everywhere, you begin to blur over them. So the question of how much they internalized, how much of it affected their actual beliefs as opposed to their outward behavior is an excellent question. So because schools fell under the central control of the government in Moscow, each school used a standardized national curriculum as well as the same textbooks. It was often argued as a, as a pro and not a con that if a student moved from Vladivostok on the east coast of the USSR to Moscow on a Monday during the school year, he would end up doing the same exact work as his peers back in Vladivostok were. You could literally move from one city to another and not miss a beat in your classroom um, work. Uh, because of the constant shortage of classroom space and trained educators, many children went to school in shifts, so a morning shift and an afternoon shift. Uh, if you read the um, diary of a Soviet schoolgirl, she mentions that she goes to school in the second shift. Um, and they also attended school six days a week, although often the sixth day was devoted to either extracurricular activities, potentially music and art, um, or they could be also incorporating some of the socially useful labor on that sixth day. Children, in general, were assigned a ton of homework during the Soviet period. It was not unusual for older students to have as much as four hours a night. I mean, I don't know how many, how many hours a night your kids have, but I, that seemed like a lot to me. Um, under Khrushchev, it was limited. He did make actual rules about how much homework could be assigned. One hour for primary school, so for younger kids, so like first grade to fifth grade. Two hours for middle school, so sort of sixth and seventh grade. And then three hours per day for secondary school students. Um, this is a, a chart which is in your folder of what the system uh, looked like. 
So this is a classroom hours chart. I can give you an idea of how many hours um, in a given time period they spent on um, studying which subject. It can also give you a comparison of the difference between what they studied and focused on the czarist regime and under the Soviet regime. Um, you can see that in the Soviet regime, they're moving away from sort of the classical European curriculum to one that focused much more on science, mathematics, and other practical subjects and skills. You'll notice that obviously all the religious co coursework was immediately removed, um, as well as the study of multiple classical European languages. The other change is the increase in the number of hours devoted to science and mathematics, which is not surprising, of course, for a country that was trying to industrialize rapidly. Children were also introduced to much more complicated concepts and, and curricula earlier under the Soviet system than they would say under the American system, as so much more material was packed into every week. Um, their focus on rote memorization and top-down teaching practices helped them cover material much more quickly. The volume of homework they were able to give also furthered that. And it wouldn't have been surprising to have a fourth grader doing um, beginning algebra and plain geometry. What was the difference in percentages of people attending school at this time? Because like that, you know, the, the training in classical um, languages and things would seem to suggest that Mm -hmm. Right. That those would have been. Yeah. That that would have been people who were sort of the bourgeois, uh -huh. who were um, potentially you know close to the czar, who were in, part of the imperial uh, vanguard. Um, and the second chart is really it's, it's 1920, but it doesn't look that different from things you might see in in 1950. Um, and during the early 1920s, they still were not enrolling most of their students in school. It wasn't until really well into the Stalin period that they were getting closer to um, universal education. Uh, it, it took a, a good long time. So the curriculum. The Soviet school day and the structure of the school. The Soviet school day was extremely formulaic and consequently uh, ended up being very boring for most students. Each lesson began with a review of the material recently covered, including a session where students were quizzed orally regarding their completed homework. Um, next came the introduction of new material and the lesson always closed by setting standards for what was going to come tomorrow. That was the routine. That's how every single classroom period worked. You can imagine how that would feel to you as an educator doing that same thing every day and how that would feel to your students knowing every day that's what they were going to have to do. That there was no, there was no movie day. There was no day when you were doing a debate. There was no day when you were doing something more interactive to sort of break up the week. As I mentioned already, they practiced a lot of rote memorization. Um, and they consequently committed a ton of information to memory. This was obviously useful in things like math, science, languages, and even in um, understanding poetry. And even today, if you meet a Russian, they can quote you the first opening stanza, stanzas to Eugene Onegin and other Pushkin poetry because it's something they were drilled on when they were young. But it, of course, it limited creative decision making, um, exploring new ideas within themselves, and expressing themselves. History, of course, was taught with complete ideological rigidity. The classroom, as I've mentioned, was very teacher-dominated. A pedagogical manual from 1940 says, by education, we mean a process directed by teachers of equipping the developing generation with the general experience of mankind in order to prepare it for the social activity that lies before it. So very structured, very boring. Teachers were in charge. They would tell you what to do and how to think. Questions were asked, not, you didn't ask, how did X influence Y? You asked, how did X negatively influence Y? Kids understood from the way that you asked the question, the answer that you wanted, that they wanted you to give. Um, and in the Gorbachev period, when people started to ask more open-ended questions, children, the kids, were paralyzed. They literally didn't know how, so as much as the teachers were paralyzed about not knowing how to implement new materials, kids were also unaware of how they should respond to questions when for so many years they were asked questions that dictated the response before they gave it. And I always love the way that, that, that Russians talk and they speechify so much. And you can always tell they're giving a talk because all of their cadence goes like this. And, and that happened a lot in school too because you knew you were up and you were performing. You were giving an answer to a question. You knew how you were supposed to answer and you would give that sort of little bit of a, a play in a way. So I, I mentioned history already as being very ideological um, rigid. Um, most history teachers, almost all history, had to be Communist Party members. Um, most citizens in the USSR were not members. The, the majority were not members of the Communist Party. It was a select group. Um, and even most teachers were not members of the Communist Party. But history teachers had to be members of the Communist Party. 
they were highly educated in politics and political ideology um, as part of their training. Um, history was taught very chronologically. Um, and they did do some world elements, but mostly it was a focus on the road to victorious socialism. How did we get to where we are today? Um, any event or person that did not measure up to this history was simply removed from the textbooks. So there were times when children themselves would be told, open, during, particularly during the 30s, during the time of the purges, when different Soviet party leaders were being purged every day, they would be told to open their textbooks and cut out the picture of Trotsky. Open your textbook and cut out the picture of Bukharin. And then a lesson would follow with, why are we cutting this out? Because he is an, he is an enemy. Why, you know, and enemies are everywhere. So it, it was used as part of um, their training. Um, and then as new textbooks would be written, they simply would be whitewashed from the history. There would be no mention of Trotsky whatsoever, not even his valuable contributions, because at that point there were no valuable contributions by Trotsky um, in the Stalin and, and period. So the idea was that the course of history at the secondary school must bring home to pupils that the downfall of capitalism and the victory of communism was inevitable, and it must disclose consistently the popular masses are the true makers of history. That was the report of one Soviet history syllabus. In the sciences, um, unlike in the 1920s when there was an idea that kids should go out and sort of get their hands dirty and be involved, um, most experiments in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, 60s were actually done by the teachers, not by the students themselves, not only because they probably didn't have enough equipment for every child to actually undertake the experiment, but there was an idea that there was no point in having the child do it because they might do it wrong, they might not interpret the lesson correctly, and they should just watch me do it because I will do it correctly, I will show them how it's done, and I will tell them the results. So you can see the way that it's structured sort of a classroom life, and there was no, there was no need for self-action. Um, every student kept a diary or a daily report card um, which showed their grades in each subject and whether or not their homework had been completed. Parents had to sign off on the diary each week and a student monitor ensured the signatures were provided. So yet again, another opportunity for a child to show sort of self-governance, to be involved in sort of the active administration of the classroom, which you could argue shows a child responsibility, gives a child an opportunity for leadership, but it didn't come off that way. It came off more like they were informers, tattletales, um, and that they were doing it not because they wanted to inculcate this sense of leadership, but because somebody had to do it in the classroom, and either they were a brown noser because they wanted to be the teacher's pet, or it was a role that was assigned to them and they couldn't escape from it. It was not something they would have chosen to do on their own. So there was also sort of a, a, a policy called Shevstva, which was basically a system of tutoring, whereby a, a poor student would engage an intensive remedial study program with an older student who understood the material well. Um, and not only are students brought to task for not performing well, but their parents were even often publicly criticized for their role in the child's um, performance or lack thereof. There would be meetings between, there would be classroom meetings between parents and teachers every six to eight weeks. So imagine having teacher night every six to eight weeks with all of the parents in your classroom. And the, the, the teacher would publicly criticize the parent and say, your Nina has been late four times in the last month. You know, your Archom, his homework is sloppy. He's not turning in on time. What kind of home do you run if his homework is so sloppy? What does that say about the home and the life that you lead? Um, it was, what? The right piece of marriage. Right. There's a, well, you know, the funny thing is, is as you read through a lot of these things, part of you says, it doesn't sound that yeah. bad. <laughs> Um, flunking was basically out of the question. Um, children were routinely promoted whether or not they had solid performance and this is not necessarily something that you're unfamiliar with. There's a lot of kids who get promoted who maybe shouldn't be because of either social reasons because you don't want to hold them back but in this instance they didn't want to have on their records that their students hadn't passed. So there was just like in an in industry where you were responsible for meeting your quota of having how many tons of steel you produced in a given week, you were a teacher and you were producing educated students. And it was an expectation that every student who entered your classroom excelled and passed and graduated onto the next level. And if they didn't, it was a reflection on you as a teacher and on the school in general, and uh, it could really hurt your work and you, as you were not meeting your quota. So a lot of kids were, um, were promoted when they maybe shouldn't have been. Do we have a question? No, yeah. 
to go. The teacher's very, very highly revered. I understand other people and law comrades, but was that seen as a, a sort of an elite profession? Not really, not really. I mean, it, it had its role in society. It was not unlike now, it was very female dominated. So in that regard alone, it had sort of a lesser status because even though they argued for male female equality, females were still less equal than men. Um, their pay was not that bad, you know, compared to other industries. Uh, it was actually, it was pretty decent, particularly after the system kind of got up and running. In the early years, it could be bad. During times of trouble, it was hard for them to get paid, things like that. But uh, overall, um, there were, the, the pay and the respect sort of grew over time. I would say that there was respect for them as, you know, in your own community, there was respect for teachers. Um, but I wouldn't say it was a highly, highly respected profession. Um, it probably more respected to be in an in industry than it to be teaching. Um, so I already mentioned before that one of the main thrusts of education was to sort of enforce <laughs> behavior. <laughs> Isn't he cute? Um, imagine where he is now. What does he look like now? He's in that face. Um, so there was a lot of behavioral norms that were foisted upon children. Um, and that was primarily because the need to maintain authority of the teacher, of the school, of uh, all adults, of the state, was a constant theme. And it was started and enforced um, from kindergarten through the 10th grade. So this shows in the behavior that was expected of children in the classroom and in the larger community. Maybe not what they could do and get away with at home, but certainly in the outside world. Um, at home, they were often exempt from these expectations. And as I've already mentioned, they were doted on by parents and grandparents. You had a lot of families who were living with um, extended relations, either living with um, grandmothers or things, or living in communal apartments where there are a lot of other adults present. So there was a lot of opportunities to have multiple adults sort of paying attention or potentially fawning on you. And um, in an article by Catriona Kelly, who's written a really intense, really large book called Children's World, which is like this big, which talks about the life of children um, from the late 18, from the 1890s till I think the 1990s. Um, she has written an article that uh, talks about sort of education during the Khrushchev period, and she has a lot of great quotes from kids talking, looking back on their education. And one girl remarked, I think the most striking early memory, what struck me more than anything else, was yes, without a doubt, was school. I hadn't experienced such a big contrast. Because the teachers were very strict, and after the kindergarten, after home, after mama and granny, it was such a big contrast. I'm not saying it was bad, it was interesting, but it was tough switching over to such a strict regime right away. So you can imagine what it was like for kids to go from their home environment, where they were doted upon, they were focused on, they were allowed to maybe be more themselves, maybe act a little bit more crazy like kids can do, to an environment where not, I mean, and, and it's the same thing with schools here, where you are expected to act in a certain way, but it was much more strict, much more rigid. Kids were not allowed to express themselves in any way. So you can imagine the disconnect and how they may or may not engage with the whole school process because of that disconnect. So. Some specifics about classroom behavior. Oh, Heidi. Just a quick question. Um, you had mentioned the alternating days that they went to school. All shifts that yeah. they went in shifts. Mm -hmm. um, how long did that continue? Was that it continued for it continued throughout the Soviet period, depending on the 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 city. I mean, there were some schools some had more resources or less. Think about the Second World War and how it impacted schools. That happened a lot, where schools have been destroyed and they had to implement a shift system, sometimes temporarily, while they could build new schools. So it happened for a, a good long time. I was just saying, yeah. parents having to get the kids up after this great time at home. And Right. And all of a sudden, you have to force them to go in, and you have to do that with all the different kids on different days. And right. Tough that must have been. Yeah. Um, so students rise when the teacher enters the room. Obviously, that's a strong sign of respect right there. Of course, they raise their hands to speak. Um, there is a practice called zvenavoy, which is basically institutionalized tattling. Um, in many cases, one child per row, because the kids sat um, at desks of where two kids would sit at a desk, and there would be rows of them. And one child per row would be sort of the, the zvenavoy. They would be the tattle. And it was their job to report to the teacher if somebody else had misbehaved, if someone had been late, if they had copied their homework from somewhere else. So there's this institutionalized spying, the idea that you're raising little informants, the idea that there are eyes everywhere, that you can't, you can't even misbehave when the teacher's back is turned because somebody else, somebody's always watching the way that you're, you're performing. The practice was widely hated by most people, as you can imagine. Um, and often, the Zvenavoys were beaten up after class. <laughs> um, 
There was also a strong system of organized cheating in Soviet classrooms, especially during the late Soviet period. Um, as I've already mentioned, students would come to class in the morning, they would review their homework, often that meant giving an oral review, sometimes just saying, okay, Jennifer, your turn, you get up and talk about you finishing your homework. And you might get up and you might stumble on, on what it was, you may not know how to answer a question, and um, one form of cheating is that everyone else who was sitting behind the teacher would say, it was Lenin, oh, it was Stalin. They would mouth things to you to try and help you out. Um, there was a lot of use of crib sheets. Um, students would, would copy directly off other kids' papers. Um, and although the, the practice was routinely denounced, particularly by the young pioneers, who were sort of the Soviet version of scouts, um, it was actually widely accepted by both kids and often teachers who did not want their students to fail because already they needed to promote them. And kids who would not allow you to cheat off them were considered mean, nasty, and spiteful. So the focus the focus of, oh, here's, the, here's a painting of the first day of school. You can see the kids in their uniforms. The girls wore like brown dresses with white aprons. They often wore these big white bushy bows in their pigtails or on top of their heads. The boys wore little, they look like little bus drivers basically, like little blue suits, um, lots of knee socks. But here's a picture on the first day that would all bring uh, flowers to their teacher and it would be a big uh, celebration. And you can see there are also, several of them are wearing the red tie that indicates that they are members of the Young Pioneers. Well, these costumes seem very gender specific, yet society is kind of emphasizing a, a lack of barriers. Do you have any sense of how they tried to make that make sense? I mean, why well, there was a lot of the places where the rubber didn't meet the road, where they said everyone's equal, they said women have equal rights, but in reality women just now had the ability to go out and work and do all the work at home, too. Because there was certainly a push to try and get men to do more domestic duties, but in reality women, again, would go out all day and work and come home and still be responsible for all the child rearing and the cooking and things like that. So there were a lot of places where they said one thing and the reality was much, much different, so. I guess just the thing here is like, these outfits are chosen by like, an official. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's an official just like wear mm -hmm. this thing mm -hmm. versus like people rebelling and being like, no, I'm just gonna wear it along. Yeah, no, and this is the costume that lasted for, throughout almost the entire Soviet period with, with very little change. And even now, which is a little bit strange, um, on the last day of school in Russia and the Russian Federation, you can wear mostly, most schools, can, you can wear whatever you want now in school in Russia. They will wear these costumes on the last day of school, although they wear them in a slightly more naughty <laughs> way. If you see photos of them, they're a little um, naughtified, um, but it's certainly, and it's much more the girls wearing the costume than the boys. The boys don't necessarily put on the, um, the bus driver uniform, but the girls often do, um, although often the um, undergarment, the, the dress is black and not, and not brown. So as I mentioned before, there was a focus on academics primarily in the schools, which should not surprise you, and much of this more direct political socialization um, was done during extracurricular activities, some of which were mandatory. Um, there was a very structured scouting system. Um, it was comprised of a three-link chain of political socialization. The first link was the Young Octoberist group, which targeted kids ages six through nine. The Young Pioneers targeted kids 10 to 15, and the Komsomol, also known as the Communist Youth League, um, targeted kids um, 16 to 28 years old. Um, they were first developed in 1922, and they were built sort of on the structure of the American Boy Scouts, and there had been a Russian Boy Scout organization that they were built on, built on, but it was deemed that the Boy Scouts, first they said, let's throw the Boy Scouts away, and then um, actually Krupskaya, uh, Lenin's wife, said, no, no, there are certain things about the Boy Scouts that are very admirable, instilling a love of country, a love of service, those are admirable things to retain, but we have to ratchet up the political um, socialization within these groups. So that's where these, these, um, these groups sort of came from, it's sort of the communist version of them. Um, all three organizations, but particularly the first two, were devoted to shaping the outlook and behavior of young people, and all three were fully co-educational. There was no Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. There were pioneers, and it was boys and girls together. Okay? Soviet leaders would argue that the primary purpose of school was academics, and the children's organizations were mostly concerned with Vospitania. The two are closely connected, said so Krupskaya. They complement one another, they intertwine, yet nonetheless they constitute separate entities. And that's sort of the separation between the church and the, extra, the rather the school and um, the extracurriculars. So the young Octoberists, all children became young Octoberists. There was no choice. You did not choose to be a scout or not. You were inducted into the young Octoberist society as soon as they entered the first grade. 
There was a public induction ceremony, which is again another big deal. Parents would come, they would bring flowers, they would take pictures. Um, two months prior to the ceremony, children would begin to learn about um, their nation's revolutionary history, Lenin living in the collective. Um, and at the ceremony, they would receive um, a pin that was a small red star. We have one um, in the back, we can show you later, um, that displays the image of a child. And it's actually a child, it's Lenin as a child. Um, and they, it's, he's in the center of this red star, and they would wear it on their lapel. The Octobers were under the direct tutelage and influence of their school's pioneers, who were responsible for ensuring that Octoberists successfully met their duties. And again, there's a lot of value in that, in helping kids structure and giving them opportunities to be buddies to younger kids. Um, the written priorities of the Octoberists were to learn to behave in a lively and independent way within the group. So you can be independent within the group. Um, to be responsible to the common cause, to fairly assess their own behavior and that of classmates. So again, this idea that you should be looking at everyone's behavior as a collective. And to learn to be a reliable helper to Komsomol and party members. They would do duties within the classroom, such as they'd be the flower helper or the cleanliness monitor. There's a lot of focus on hygiene in the Soviet Union. They would literally say, your hair looks raggedy today. Tomorrow you should come in and it should be cleaner. Um, your socks are dirty. Make sure you come in and have them clean. They could serve as a library monitor or the teacher's chief assistant, etc. Um, once a month, they attended an assembly or marched um, in full dress. And uh, their assemblies would start with a roll call, the singing of patriotic songs, a brief lecture on Soviet industry, potentially featuring a guest, and would be overseen by a pioneer. And I try and think about a six-year-old standing and listening to a lecture about how many logs had been cut down in Vorkuta. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about, but this was their daily existence. And for the most part, a lot of kids liked being in the pioneers. They were with their friends. It wasn't just political um, activities. There were a lot of also hobbies and crafts and things, particularly once you got a little bit older. So there were people who look back on being a pioneer very favorably. So that should be understood. Um, so the pioneers, by the end of the third grade, children were preparing to become young pioneers. And although all students became pioneers, again, it was mandatory, um, they used a phased induction system. Only 10 kids could be inducted into the pioneers at a time. And they did that for a variety of reasons. One, they did want to reward a little bit some kids who showed more initiative and had better grades. And two, they wanted to use it as a carrot to other kids to continue to work hard, to continue to do your best so that they could eventually be fa um, phased in. And there was a real sense that I want to be in the first brigade that's inducted in my class or the second brigade. There was, there was a point of honor in that. Um, those that are called to the induction ceremony receive their red kerchief. You saw a little bit in the uh, My Perestroika video of the kids, the older pioneers, bestowing the younger pioneers with their red kerchiefs. They also received a new pin to put on their lapel, which was a bust of Lenin, uh, which was um, emblazoned on top with three crimson flames and their motto, which was not unlike the Boy Scouts, was um, always ready. Um, and this is their, they didn't do this, they did, they did this. That was their salute. Induction ceremonies were often timed to coincide with Soviet holidays or days of importance, such as Pioneer Day, Victory Day, Lenin's birthday. And again, they were attended by uh, families, teachers, other pioneers, ex-servicemen, and pensioners. Like, it was a pretty big deal in a community. People made a big deal out of it. The Pioneers was a very highly organized structure. Each pioneer belonged to a link, which met weekly. Each link, or three to four links, would join together to form a troop that met two to three times per month. And each troop in the school joined together to form a council, which was directed by a board containing older pioneers as well as students. It was a really big industry. There were a lot of people involved. There were people whose job it was to run, I mean, not like the Boy Scouts, people whose job it is to run s several councils or several districts to help develop the um, activity plan for a certain group of pioneers and make sure that it happens. So what are some of the activities they would undertake? Um, well, a lot of hand-holding to younger pioneers or to younger um, young Octoberists, um, collecting scrap paper and metal. There would be big drives to like run around the neighborhood and get everyone's scrap paper um, to recycle it. Um, participating in campouts, so there were like a lot of natural outdoors kind of opportunities, um, and other activities that one might associate with the Boy Scouts. The most famous pioneer um, was uh, a boy named Pavlik Morozov, which some of you may know the story. Um, in 1932, 13-year-old Pavlik, who was, um, by all estimations, a real boy, was a model pioneer, an ardent communist who actively participated in Stalin's collectivization campaigns. He reported his father to the local NKVD for profiteering on the sale of grain. Um, his father was arrested and executed 
um, as a result. Unhappy with Pavlik for acting as an informant against his own family, other family members, his grandfather, his uncle, his cousin, um, killed him. And although the story is almost certainly not true in the way that I just told it, there is some underlying truth. There seems to be a boy named Pavlik Morozov who was killed in 1932, but they've spun it for a propagandistic tale, and people would, lit, would, would yearn to be like Pavlik. They wanted to be the, like, the, the model boy who embodied the spirit of, of communism. Um, I mentioned before, this is kind of the big industry. Pioneers would hang out at the Pioneer House of Culture, or something called the Pioneer Palace. Um, there are Pioneer Palaces all over the USSR. It was basically a youth center. Um, and you could come in and there were different rooms assigned to different activities. There were um, different, there might be a ping pong table or other things you could partake in. Um, often these places were run either by the local Soviet government or by a local industry. Say you lived in a town that had a big uh, lumber mill, maybe the lumber mill factory would sort of um, run or uh, actually pay for this place to run. Um, also, there were a lot of pioneer camps that would happen over the summer that kids would attend. So in general, pioneer activities were very much a part of their daily life. Um, I think that in a lot of ways there were a lot that was admirable about the pioneer organization. And there were certainly um, kids were being kept busy. In fact, after the fall of the USSR, after these kids no longer had these outlets, there was a huge rise in arrests of young people in the juvenile delinquency. And whether that was because they no longer had to conform and worry about their behavior because of a political standpoint where you weren't always feeling you were being watched or because they didn't have outlets to spend their time in a more um, productive way, it's not entirely clear. Yeah. It's sort of interesting too because it so parallels like Nazi youth movement um, and there's a, a kind of similar story in the Nazi mm -hmm. movement about a, a young um, boy who's killed by a communist. Um, and then it, it rises, but it's just, it's interesting that the similarities yeah. in the indoctrinated these. Mm -hmm. um, you, you could choose to be a pioneer, right? No, pioneer was pretty much mandatory. Comsomol was not mandatory. Oh. In fact, it was selective. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's what I was going to ask, yeah. like what percentage of kids became almost, pioneers? Or Comsomol? Almost all of them pioneers, but Comsomol was much smaller. Uh, so I think I, I read 6% of the eligible youth population were members. I don't have a year for that statistic, I'm sorry. Um, so the Komsomol, like I said, was different from the pioneers and the Octoberists. It was overtly political. It was grooming individuals for eventual membership in the Communist Party. In fact, the organization itself was directly subordinate to the Central Committee of the Communist Party. It was much more selective, obviously, than the two previous groups. You had to complete a detailed application to be a member and you had to be referred by two Komsomol members or Communist Party members in good standing. Um, so Lenin's argued in 1920 that it is the job of the Youth League to educate communists. The whole purpose of training, educating, and teaching young people today is to imbue them with communist ethics. Um, so like I mentioned, their activities were mostly political. They attended lectures, study groups, exhibitions. They prepared something called wall newspapers with news about um, about uh, party policies, pol party directives. They also ran three major publishing houses that controlled all Soviet youth periodicals. And there were a huge number of periodicals that targeted Soviet youth. Um, each organization, the Pioneers, the Octoberists, and the Komsomol, had a corresponding magazine or two, um, including Komsomolskaya Pravda, which had a daily print run of 10 million. And although that it's been argued that most teenagers in the USSR were turned off by the overtly political organization, so not only was the Komsomol um, selective in who they chose, there were not as many people interested in joining the Komsomol. And I'm sure partly part of that is because teenagers are not always interested in joining anything, particularly something that is political. Um, one of the readings in, or in Soviet B rumors to talk about how you basically have joined if you really wanted like a high level career, yes. was that? Yes, you know, that's absolutely true. I was just about to say, participation in the Komsomol prepared you for life if you were interested in being a Communist Party member or having a job that could only be held by a Communist Party member. There would be, if you wanted to attend the university, you had to have a letter in your file that you were in the Komsomol. So there were specific things 
that required that participation, but so not all things. So if you wanted to be a history teacher, yeah. probably right. If you if you had to be a party member, yeah. If you wanted to work in the government, local, mm -hmm. you know, you, you would have to be uh, have been in the council. So I wanted to take a brief detour into children's literature because it's one, it's extraordinarily interesting, and it's also was was highly used in socializing children, of course. Um, it's no doubt, there's no doubt that children's literature played a significant role in providing models of behavior and norms of expectations. Um, but again, this trajectory of the kinds of literature that were allowed sort of followed that initial trajectory that I mentioned, how in the 1920s there was a big period of, of creativity, there was a lot of experimentation with form, there was a lot of design, you'll see a lot of, um, there's actually a book in the back that was, is a, um, it's about an exhibit that was held at the University of Chicago about children's literature, and you can see all the different kinds of forms that were used in the 1920s um, that were sort of experimental, that wouldn't have been allowed, particularly under socialist realism, where they really wanted everything to be really representational of what a person and a figure looked like. Um, so I should say by the late 1920s, the Communist Party had complete control over most publishing houses in the USSR. Um, and as I've said, the Komsomol itself administered three such houses. Um, overall, whereas children's literature in the West has tended to encourage children to stretch their imaginations, think creatively, um, and develop inquiring minds, in the regime like the USSR, literature teaches children to conform to correct Stalinist values and not to question the state of things. Instead of leading one to question one's place in the world, Soviet children's literature advocated pride of place for the Soviet Union and total conformity to its values. So like I said, in the 1920s, there was this period of experimentation. In the 1930s, is a real crackdown, and the message becomes much less subtle, particularly during the first, year, first five year plan. Things were extraordinarily overt. Books about tractors, books about like, really mundane industrial things, and they were extraordinarily unpopular. Kids did not want to read this stuff. So they sort of reoriented themselves in the early 1930s to try and do a hybrid approach where they were definitely drilling home soci um, socialist values, but they were trying to produce stories that kids actually wanted to read. Because what's the point of making them if no kid wants to read them? So um, what they did in the 30s, which is a little bit surprising, is that they, one, they allowed folklore to be brought back in. Folklore was initially, I think Robin touched on this too, was, um, was considered to be very czarist. It was part of the sort of the old regime. But they brought it back in such a way that it could be sort of communized, where it could be brought to bear on, on socialist values. The other thing they did, which was a little bit surprising, is they allowed for individual heroes in a lot of stories, where you would think, this is supposed to be about the communal, everyone's supposed to work together, but they would allow for heroes, which kids love to read about heroes. They love to read about individuals that accomplish something, as long as these heroes were embodying the ideals of the USSR. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one example is um, Buratino down here, who was basically the Soviet Pinocchio. Um, in the Western version of the tale, obviously Pinocchio is brought to life by the Blue Fairy. He gets in a lot of trouble, but he redeems himself in the end, and he's rewarded individually as, by becoming a real live boy. He's achieved a very individual goal, although he may have also made his father happy. But in the Buratino stories, although much of the plot is the same, the actual things that he does, in the end, he doesn't become a real life boy for himself. He rids the village of a villain, and he brings happiness to the whole collective by his actions. Um, another example, another story which was a little bit crazy, is called The Disobedience Holiday, a tale for children and parents. And you, hear, you can hear the moral coming already. So not unlike in the story of Where the Wild Things Are, if you're familiar, in that story, Max, a young boy, is sent to his room for misbehaving, and he dreams up a world where he is sort of, um, he goes and, and meets these incredible creatures and has an adventure, but then chooses to come back home to his family. Unlike in Where the Wild Things Are, the boy, who gets in trouble and sent to his room, does not let his imagination carry him away. Instead, a magical kite comes and takes him away, He's not the actor, he is the acted upon in this story. And it takes him away, away to a land where there are no parents and no punishment. Um, on the first day, all the kids eat all the ice cream they want. They deface property, they smoke cigars, and they run all day um, willy-nilly, run around. Not unlike Pleasure Island, if you've seen the Disneyfied version of, of Pinocchio. By day two, they're tired, their stomachs hurt, and they're bored from too much freedom. <laughs> they beg for the magical kite, to take them home to their parents. And when their parents do return to them on the third day, all the children stand before them, lined up as if on parade, the boys combed and freshly washed, so it goes back to their obsession with hygiene, 
in well-pressed suits and polished shoes, and the girls gaily dressed with bows in their well-brushed hair. Quiet and obedient, ready to fill any assignment or request, exemplary model children. So this is what the kids are reading. The other example is they also did a lot of stories about exploration. There'd be a lot of the stories about people going off to the North Pole. Like um, they mentioned in, in Three Songs of Lenin, there was the parade about people coming back from the North Pole. And as you saw in the fur hat, he is a writer of sort of uh, adventure tales. So there was a lot about that too. Um, what was the name again of the Where the Wild Things Are? Dis the Disobedience Tale. No, the Dis Disobedience Holiday, a tale for children and parents. And I got both of those examples from an article that I'd be happy to share with people. And she makes the argument about bringing folklore back in and bringing in um, sort of the heroes. And she gives a couple of more references, too, that you could uh, potentially use. Um, this obsession with hygiene, mm -hmm. any, like, is it just because it was so many peasants and so, you know, farm and nobody had running water and plumbing and... I think it's a lot of things. I think part of it is about perception, too. They wanted people to look and act a certain way. And I think part of it also is about productivity and about schedules. The way they argued for it in some of the, um, about education is that they talked a lot about preschool schedules and telling kids when they could go to the bathroom, when they would clean up, being obsessed with sort of the rigid implementation of their day. So it would say, like, at this o'clock, you wake up and take your bath. At this o'clock, you go and eat your breakfast. At this o'clock, you go to the bathroom. So part of it is about that as well. But... I don't have a, a fully complete answer for, for that. Um, so my last question, my conclusion, comes down to a couple of questions. One, were there efforts in the educational system successful in creating the new Soviet man? And some of their methods, methods seem really honorable. A lot of us were shaking our heads during this presentation about that. That doesn't sound so bad. So, but was it all fruit from the, the poisonous seed, you know? Um, so regarding the first question, we should remember that Americans often perceived and described the Soviet education system as brutal, communistic, and anti-democratic, but they also talk about how effective it is. They're highly educated. They went from being a very backwards nation in 1917 to having millions of tractors by the 1930s. They won the Second World War. They put the first man into space. They had the first you know, um, satellite in orbit. So there was a lot of fear, particularly during the Cold War, that we were being eclipsed, not unlike the fear that we're having today that we're being eclipsed by China. There's a great time series, which Cynthia's talk reminded me of, and I'll try and get access to it, where they, the, the front cover is an American, sort of all-American boy, you know, corn-fed, Iowan on the left, and then there's a Soviet counterpart on the right, and they follow them through a couple of days of school, and just by looking at the pictures, like, the American boy is just going to sock hops, and he's having fun, and the Soviet boy is not going to sock hops. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a way, their system was successful in creating uh, a highly educated population relatively quickly that did a have a lot of industrial and technological accomplishments. Um, was the Vospitania, sort of the moral education, very effective um, and successful? Well, yes and no. I think it certainly waxed and waned over time. It was more effective earlier than rather than later. Um, the dream early on that socialism could really happen was really exciting for people and they, and they bought into it more than they did over time, which we've already sort of mentioned. But during the Stalin years and the Brezhnev years, people began to understand the difference between what they were being taught and how people actually lived. And most were just going through the motions. Um, and there also seemed to be a cutoff point around 14 or 15 where kids were just not as interested in being a part of this kind of movement and the influence therefore diminished rapidly at that time. Um, that said, by depriving Soviet youth of choice and forcing conformity in their earliest years and instilling in them a sense of community over individual, they did also manage to create one of the most stable societies in the world that had actually very little violence, unless, of course, you count the violence that was perpetrated by the regime itself. Um, as for the question number two, were their methods wholly bad? I don't think so. I think there was a lot of honorable intentions in their methods. Um, I don't know if it's a question of how the methods were designed, how they were implemented, how they were reacted to by the children um, that made them a success or less of a success. Um, there was no differentiation, of course, for students with different needs or different abilities. Um, there was no attempt to individualize anything for the student experience. Um, everything was subservient to the collective. Um, but as I said, as I researched this, and, and being a parent myself, I thought, sounds nice to have a kid helping out another kid. It sounds nice for a kid to be watching out for somebody else, to have a structure and a place for them to play after school as a parent. So there was a lot about the system that sounded very ideal. Now, whether or not that system could ever be implemented in a way that was really successful and still allowed children to have a voice in the system is not really my place to determine. 
So 